Welcome everyone um, to the third uh, webinar in our series of five as part of the UCL Penn Global COVID study um, sponsored by the uh, UCL Global Engagement Fund. I know the session will be a very exciting one um, uh, with lots of interesting results from our global uh, COVID study. Um, and in the first part of the um, session, what will happen is our panel speakers will present um, a short, roughly uh, 15 minute to 20 minute presentation. After the presentations, uh, there will be a question and answer session as well, where we welcome all of you on the call to, um, you know, tell us your question or even throw the question in the chat. Um, and our, and I will as chair, uh, fuel those questions to our panel uh, speakers today. So just to just a brief summary, I know many of you know us already, but uh, I am Carrie. I'm an assistant professor at the UCL Institute of Education and the lead investigator of the UCL Penn Global COVID study. I know half of you on the call probably uh, have taken part in our study, so we're really grateful for all of your support and we thank you. Um, I'm so glad that we can at least virtually meet you. Um, and for those of you who are joining anyways, we hope uh, you're able to take something away with you today as well. I will be chairing the session today. And just to give you a brief background of our study, it's a longitudinal survey looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on our mental health, physical health and relationships. Today, we are thrilled uh, to present some data with you uh, at our third um, webinar of a series of five. Um, we, uh, so we welcome all of you here today. Um, and today in particular, I'm very happy to have two of my uh, panelists here with us. One is uh, Dr. Uh, Jill Portnoy. Uh, Jill is an assistant professor in the School of Criminology and Justice Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Lowell. She received her PhD in criminology from the University of Pennsylvania in 2015. Her research examines biological and social risk factors for antisocial behavior, aggression, and psychopathy in both children and adults. She is especially interested in ways in which stress-related biological processes interact with family and neighborhood contexts to predict adverse behavioral outcomes. She has also examined the relationship between nutrition and behavior problems in children and is currently examining these relationships in adults as well. Her prior research showed that a nutritional intervention for children that improved ch child behavior also led to improvements in parental behavior. Her work aims to contribute to a more comprehensive understanding of the development of behavior problems in children and adults by taking into account family dynamics, very important, as well as biological and environmental contexts. This work has been recognized internationally, and in 2018, she was awarded the Early Career Award from the American Society of Criminology's Division of Developmental and Life Course Criminology. We will be hearing from Jill in just a second. I'd also like to introduce you to our panel discussant. So, uh, Dr. Shahara Michael is an assistant teaching professor at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Lowell. She teaches courses on child maltreatment, st statistics, research methods, and cr criminal justice systems at, the, at this university. Um, her research interests include childhood victimization, juvenile delinquency, and intimate partner violence. She has a BA in psychology, a BS in uh, Criminal Justice and an MA in Criminal Justice and Criminology from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. She has also been awarded an MA in Theological Studies by Miami International Seminary and a PhD in Sociology at the University of New Hampshire. Jahara, Jahara has been involved in studies or projects that focus on the prevention of sexual violence on college campuses, juvenile prostitution, witnessing parental physical aggression, partner assault, dyadic patterns of conflict and corporal punishment. Her main objective is to be part of and advance the discourse on childhood victimization in order to positively affect change in social policies and public health practices. So with that 
said, and a stellar introduction and welcome to our panelists as well. I'll now like to pass the uh, stage on to Jill, who is ready to present um, to us on her findings. Over to you, Jill. Thank um, the members of the study team who have contributed to the data collection for this study and made all of this possible. Um, and also not pictured here who I'd like to thank is um, my new doctoral student, Anna Christina Bedoya, who's been helping with this project as well. So today I'll be talking about family relationships during the COVID-19 pandemic. And before we get started, I just wanna introduce sort of a theoretical framework for how I'm thinking about family relationships during the pandemic. Um, and generally speaking, um, when we think about family relationships, one way to do this is by using what we sometimes call a transactional or reciprocal model of parent-child behavior. So typically when we think about relationships between parent behavior and child behavior, we often look at how a parent's behavior impacts a child's behavior. Um, so for instance, the way somebody parents, um, the way they discipline their child, we often expect that to impact the child's behavior. Um, if a parent is depressed, for instance, um, we find that the child um, will be more likely to be depressed. Um, when parents experience marital conflict, this can lead to problems in children, um, like conduct problems or emotional problems. So typically when we think about relationships between parent and child behavior, we think about how parents affect their children. What researchers focus on less often is how children impact their parents. So in addition to knowing that parents impact their children, what research is also showing is that children impact their parents. So when children have higher levels of conduct problems, say when they're more aggressive, we find that this leads to later marital conflict in their parents as well. It can change the way the parent actually parents their child um, so they might use more harsh parenting tactics. It can lead to parental stress um, and it can lead to depression. Um, so for those of you who are parents, this probably makes a lot of sense to you. Um, but researchers in large part have not fully taken into account this transactional model where really things are in some ways circular. Parents affect their kids. Um, kids in turn affect their parents through this reciprocal or transactional process. Um, we can think about this transactional model in a slightly more complex way. Um, if we imagine that we had two waves of data collection. So we might measure the parent's behavior and the child's behavior at a first time point, which I'll call wave one. And then again, at a second time point, maybe six months later, which we'll call wave two. We would expect that the parent's behavior at wave one would be associated with their behavior at wave two. People who are depressed at wave one are going to be more likely to be depressed six months later. We would also expect that the parent's behavior would influence the child's behavior at wave two. So like we said, if the parent is more depressed, for instance, or more stressed out, that might have an impact on the child's um, conduct problems or depression um, six months later at wave two. And we would see similar things for the child. So the child's behavior at wave one will probably be associated with the behavior at wave two. Um, sometimes we say that our best, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And similarly, the child's behavior at wave one would also be um, expected to influence the parent's behavior at wave two. So this is a slightly more complex way of demonstrating that transactional model I showed you in the last slide. <clears throat> So the goal of the current study is to start applying this transactional model to relationships between parents and children's behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I know a lot of you actually participated in this study and we all have lived through this pandemic. <laughs> um, so before we continue, I just wanted to do a brief poll to get a sense of uh, what the audience here experience was with certain family relationships during the pandemic. So I'll launch a poll here. There's just two quick questions. 
If you'd like, you can just take a second um, to answer those questions and then I'll share results with the group. All right, so it looks like almost everybody has voted. So I will go ahead and share those results. So it looks like um, about 30% of the audience here um, did have a child at home during the pandemic. So um, maybe experience some of the stressors we'll talk about today. Um, in terms of stressors that the audience experienced, it seems like learning new online tools um, was a fairly common stressor for the audience. Um, work as well looks like was the most common stressor. Um, some parents, it seems like, seems like most people were probably parents, were stressed about their child's school or childcare being closed. Um, we also have people who are stressed about finances, being bored, um, as well as romantic or relationships or marriage, which we'll talk about as well today. So um, why look at family relationships during the pandemic? Well, we know that COVID-19 was a very unique situation that contribute, contributed to stress for many parents. So as some of you guys noted, you had stress when your children's schools closed. Um, some parents had childcare issues. They had to start um, dealing with distance learning, working from home, sometimes with kids. It was also a unique situation where families were sort of stuck together for really long periods of time. And in some cases, socially isolated while they were trying to deal with all of these stressors. And studies are now coming out that um, parents did report high levels of stress during the pandemic. Um, so one study found that 46% of US parents reported high stress levels during the pandemic. And this was compared to 28% of adults that didn't have children. So parents did seem to be uniquely impacted by their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've also seen globally in the US and also abroad, an increase in mental health problems among children as well. So families in many ways seem to have been impacted during this pandemic. Um, and we see ways in which um, both child's behavior and parents' behavior were affected. So one recent study found that when parents reported COVID-19 related hardships, they had a more negative mood, um, but their children were also less cooperative and more worried. So children, during this pandemic seem to have been affected by the experiences of their parents. Um, another study in Singapore found that parental's COVID-19 related stress um, had negative effects on the parent-child relationships as well as parenting quality. So when parents were more stressed, the quality of their parenting went down. So this does suggest to us the possibility that we might have some of these reciprocal or transactional parent-child effects um, taking place during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the goal of the current study, um, given this, is to start testing this transactional model. Given the data we currently have available, we won't be testing the full model today. We'll just be testing part of the model. So we'll be testing the part of the model shown here. Um, so specifically what we'll be focusing on is the effects of child behavior on later parental behavior. Um, but what we will take into account is parents' behavior at wave one. Um, the reason for this is that we want to understand whether children's behavior is actually predicting changes in the parent's behavior. So how is child behavior predicting how the parent's behavior changes from wave one to wave two? Um, specifically, we'll be focusing on the following research question. Did child behavior problems predict changes in subsequent parental depression, stress, and relationship conflict during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and of course, we'll be using data um, to answer these questions from the UCL Penn Global COVID Study. So many of you are familiar with this study, um, having taken part in it. But just to give you a brief overview, wave one of the study took place during the first UK lockdown. 
Um, most of the participants in the study were from the UK, which is why I'm situating in terms of that lockdown. So this was from April 17th to July 14th that the Wave 1 data was collected. Um, and that data was collected from a little over 2,000 participants. Wave 2 was collected um, during the second and third UK lockdown periods. So this was from October 17th through January 31st, 2021, and included a little over 1,000 participants. Wave three of this study is currently ongoing. So we'll be looking at data from waves one and two in the current study. And the study asked um, about lots of different variables. Um, so we collected information on participants' backgrounds and demographics, their mental health, um, some changes in their pre and post COVID lifestyle. So things like how their exercise changed, their alcohol consumption changed and their substance use changed, as well as relation, uh, questions about their relationships, um, trust, uh, relational conflict and parenting as well. So for the purpose of the analyses I'm presenting today, um, I'll be using data from waves one and two, um, because like I mentioned, wave three data collection is currently ongoing. And um, analyses will be limited to the 413 participants who were living with at least one child who was under age 18 at wave one. So looking here at parents with uh, children under 18 living at home. So who were our participants in this um, subsample of the study? Um, like I mentioned, a uh, little over half were from the UK, um, but we also had about 16% from Greece, 14% from the US, um, and some from Hong Kong and from Italy. So um, looking at a global sample here. Uh, the parents in this study um, were on average around 40. They had an average of a little over one child um, and the number of children they had ranged between one child and five children. Most of our sample here was female. Um, primarily the sample was married and the average age of the children in the sample was about nine and a half years old. So what data did we use in these particular analyses? Um, we used data about um, children, um, specifically children who are between the ages of four to 18 years old. Parents were asked to report on the behavior of their children using a questionnaire known as the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. Um, the, strength and the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, or the SDQ, has several subscales. Um, so we used, in particular, um, three subscales. The first is the emotional problems subscale. So this asks parents um, questions like, um, how often does your child have many worries? So it's trying to capture um, symptoms um, similar to depression and anxiety in children. We also use the conduct problems scale, um, which measures what we sometimes refer to as externalizing behavior. So outward directed negative behaviors like aggression or rule breaking. And we also measured children's levels of hyperactivity as well using the SDQ. If parents had more than one child, um, they rated each of their children on these scales. And for the purpose of this study, we only use data from the child with the highest level of behavior problems. So for instance, if a parent had two children, we used um, the data from the child who had higher levels of emotional problems um, when we were looking at emotional problems. Um, parents also reported on themselves. Um, so they reported on their level of depression at waves one and two. They also reported on their levels of stress at waves one and two. They did this using a 26 item inventory, um, which listed different stressors related to COVID. For each of the items, they indicated whether or not they had experienced that stressor. And if they had, they indicated what level of stress it caused them. 
Um, so this allowed us to create an overall stress level index based on all these items. And I'll show you some of these items in the next slide. We also, um, for parents who were in a relationship, um, measured their levels of relationship conflict at wave two. Um, so unlike depression and stress, we only have relationship conflict at wave two. So we won't be looking at whether child behavior predicted changes in relationship conflict. Um, we'll just be looking at whether child behavior at wave one predicts later relationship conflict at wave two. <clears throat> relationship conflict was measured with the marital coping inventory. So participants were asked how they typically dealt with conflict in their relationships. Um, the items on this inventory um, are items um, that involve resolving conflict um, with more conflict-based tactics rather than cooperative tactics. So things like yelling or shouting at your partner or picking fights with your partner over small issues. So we created an overall relationship conflict score based on these items. So just to give you a sense of some of the stressors experienced by our participants, um, these are um, stressors from wave one in particular. You can see at wave one, interestingly, one of the most common sources of stress was other people not social distancing. <clears throat> but mental health was also a major stressor. Work was a major stressor, catching COVID-19, um, finances, um, marriage or romantic relationships cause stress in a little under 20% of our participants, um, a little fewer um, than 10% of participants experience stress engaging with new online learning tools, um, as some of you guys reported um, experiencing stress uh, related to this as well at the beginning of the talk. Um, so I'll talk briefly um, about these statistical analyses we used in this study. Um, we used ordinary least squares regression um, with wave two parental depression, stress, and relationship conflict as the dependent variables in those regression analyses. Our independent variables were the child behavior problems. So those child emotional problems, conduct problems, and hyperactivity. And we controlled um, in this study for the parent sex, age, their number of children living at home, um, their marital status, and their wave one parental depression and stress. And again, we did that because we're most interested in whether child behavior actually predicted changes in parental depression and stress from waves one and two. So we'll start with parental depression. What you can see here, um, everything bolded is significant. Um, so children's conduct problems at wave one predicted parental depression at wave two. So parents of kids that had more conduct problems were more likely to be depressed later. Um, parents level of depression at wave one also predicted their depression at wave two, which as I mentioned before is to be expected. Um, the best predictor of future behavior or mental health is your past behavior or mental health. Um, you can see that the marriage variable was also significant. Um, what this means is that people who were married were actually less likely to be depressed at wave two. Whether their participant was female, their age, or their number of children wasn't related to their level of depression. When we look at emotional problems, we get similar results. So parents of children who had higher levels of emotional problems at wave one were more likely to be depressed at wave two. And the results are the same for wave one depression and marriage. Um, for hyperactivity, um, hyperactivity was not significantly associated with parental depression at wave two. But if you look at their, the p-value there, it's 0.06, um, which is often considered marginally significant. So um, wave one child hyperactivity um, was a marginally significant predictor of wave two parental depression. When we look at parental stress level, we get similar results. Um, so children's conduct problems at wave one 
predicted an increase in stress in parents at wave two um, and their wave one stress, as we would expect, was associated with their wave two stress. Marriage here um, was also significant. Um, so what this means in this case is that people who were married were less stressed than people who were not married. Um, like before, um, uh, parental sex, parental age, and their number of children was not associated with their stress level. We get similar results here for emotional problems. So parents of children who had higher levels of emotional problems at wave one were more likely to experience higher levels of stress at wave two. And similarly, parents of children who are more hyperactive at wave one were more likely to be stressed at wave two as well. So finally, we looked at relationship conflict in wave two. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have wave one relationship conflict, so we won't be controlling for that here. Um, interestingly, childhood conduct problems were not associated with wave two relationship conflict. So um, when children had higher levels of behavior problems, it didn't seem to be associated with higher levels of conflict. Um, the only variable that was significant in this model was participant sex. So actually females reported higher levels of relationship conflict than did males. Um, but married people um, didn't differ in their levels of relationship conflict. Um, relationship conflict also didn't differ by parental age or the number of children that they had. As with childhood conduct problems, emotional problems also did not predict relational relationship conflict at wave two. Um, and similarly, child hyperactivity was not associated with relationship conflict at wave two. So just to give you a summary of what we found. Um, so we found, as we would expect, that parental depression and stress predicted parental depression and stress at wave two. Um, more interestingly, what we found is that child conduct, emotional and hyperactivity problems at wave one predicted higher levels of parental depression and stress at wave two. And this was even after controlling for baseline levels of parental depression and stress. Um, however, child behavior did not predict wave two relationship conflict. Um, so child behavior only seemed to predict um, parental depression and stress. Um, so what do we make about of all this and how do we situate it in the context of, of past research? So like I mentioned, more research to date has focused on how parent behavior affects child behavior and less research has focused on how child behavior affects parent behavior. Um, this is a big limitation because as most parents know, a child's behavior is very likely to affect the parent's behavior. The limited research we do have um, does show that child behavior problems do predict later marital conflict, parental stress, depression, and also parenting quality. So this research um, that I talked about today builds on the prior research by demonstrating really how child behavior affects parent behavior during this unique time of COVID where lots of people were under heightened stress and really experiencing unique stressors related to parenting and unique stressors that were affecting children as well. Um, you know, there's been research about the effects of disasters on child and parent behavior, um, but COVID-19 was a really unique situation where people often were in their homes stuck with their families. Well, some say stuck, maybe some, not everybody felt stuck for long periods of time. So a really unique time period to examine these relationships. I think one interesting thing that's worth noting um, one result I didn't talk about here um, is that parental depression and stress actually at both at waves one and wave two were associated with relationship conflict at wave two. So parents who are more depressed and stressed did have higher levels of relationship conflict, 
even though their children's behavior wasn't associated with their relationship conflict. So this does raise the question about why child behavior was not associated with relationship conflict in this study. Um, and during the q and I welcome any ideas anybody has about this I, as well. Um, one possibility relates to the fact that we didn't measure child rearing conflict specifically. We asked about relationship conflict generally and there's been some research showing that it's marital conflict over child rearing specifically that links um, behavior problems in adolescence to marital conflict or dissatisfaction. So it could be because we didn't measure child rearing conflict specifically, that's why we didn't have effects of child behavior on um, relationship conflict. Um, I think it's also worth noting that we have a relatively um, normative sample here. Um, so we didn't um, seek out um, parents of children who had especially high levels of behavior problems. So it could be that the level of behavior problems in this sample just weren't high enough um, to um, reach the point where um, the children's behavior had an impact on relationship conflict. I think um, just before we wrap up, I wanna talk about how prior research has looked at the effects of disasters on families. So like I mentioned, um, you know, in general, we find that um, disasters, um, both natural and man-made, um, do affect family dynamics. Um, so for instance, during the Great Recession, we found that there was increased risk of child abuse. Um, generally speaking, parents who are exposed to war tend to be less warm and more harsh to their children. Um, and this partially explains um, why parental war exposure tends to be linked to poor child adjustment. Um, we also saw some evidence of reciprocal effects during Hurricane Sandy. Um, so there was evidence that children's anxiety before Hurricane Sandy may have impacted mothers' levels of post-Sandy depression. So there is some prior research showing that disasters can have effects on both parents and their children. And this current study builds on this research um, by looking into family processes during um, a fairly unique, like I mentioned, stressful event for families. What will still be needed in future research um, is a full test of this transactional model that I mentioned. So as I discussed, the current study that I'm presenting the results from is looking specifically at how children affect their parents. The next step of this research will be to look at how parents also affect their children through a reciprocal process. Um, but even without this future research, um, our results do suggest that supporting parents during periods of natural disaster um, could help to improve their mental health outcomes, um, both for themselves and for their children and reduce their levels of stress and depression. Um, but not only that, and any time we're thinking about intervening um, during this type of situation, we need to think about the family unit as a whole rather than just focusing on children or just focusing on parents. So any intervention aimed at helping families will need to tackle both the child's behavior and the parent's behavior and mental health in order to be most effective. So I'll wrap up there and turn it over to Jahaira. Um, thank you all so much for listening and for being here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing more of your feedback during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Jill. That was fantastic. And I think there's you left us with a lot of questions to consider and think about. And I'm sure many of the people on the call will um, start populating our chat with questions as well as we now perhaps transition uh, to Dr. Jahaira Michael's presentation. Um, after her presentation, we will then take questions uh, in turn. So thank you so much, Jill. And uh, we will come back to you with questions in a second. Over to you, Jahaira. Thank you very much, Dr. Wan. And thank you very much, Dr. Point Nora. Um, so I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, well, first, let me start with just some, some statements of gratitude. 
um, I was looking at the data collection, right? So this study and sort of when the data collection efforts started, you know, in context um, of the social phenomenon we are sort of still in. Um, and I just want to say thank you. <laughs> While most of us were trying to figure out, you know, how we're just going to go from day to day, like there was a group uh, of people who were sort of continuing to um, engage in the things that we need in order to understand our society better and then be able to make um, better decisions about how we can take care of our children and our families. So special kudos uh, for being on the front lines. We talk about you know, medical professionals and law enforcement and people in government. And um, I just think it's important to sort of acknowledge um, the work that you've done. And I, I'm extremely grateful for the efforts that you made during times of uncertainty so that today when the dust is starting to sort of settle, we can have these conversations and um, add to the accumulation of knowledge and be able to make recommendations based on data. So thank you um, for, for doing this. Thank you for your time. Thank you all of you for being here today and for contributing to this discussion. Um, so I, I'm going to, Dr. Wang sort of uh, connected the, the, the conversation from Dr. Portnoy and myself by saying that, um, that we were left with many, many questions. And, and I'm going to do something very, very similar. I actually feel like I have more questions than I have answers or tidbits um, of insights to contribute. And I think that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, I'm a teacher. I love research, but I'm a teacher at heart. And I believe that a good teacher leaves um, the people um, who uh, a teacher is talking to with questions that can then be sort of followed and added on. So um, I'm actually going to start with questions <laughs> as opposed to um, explanations of some of the some of the findings. So um, my first question is in terms of what more we can answer is um, we know that this presentation's work it is based on wave one and wave two data and that wave three is currently ongoing. And it's, I think if I understood it correctly, it's about to be finished from April to July. Uh, and so wave three is, is basically almost at your fingertips. Um, but I'm already looking sort of ahead and I'm just curious, are there any plans for longer term data collection efforts? Um, being that six months or 12 months or 18 months or 24 months um, may, provide different results, you know, sort of sustained, how are people bearing out at the beginning of this pandemic, in the middle of it in wave one, wave two, six months later, and now sort of a year out. I mean, a lot has changed in our society and we have sort of learned to adapt. And so I'm just sort of curious as to what the thoughts are, the future research plans for future data collection efforts, particularly a way forward, if that's even um, in your plans. And the reason why I ask that is because of the unintended, or the unexpected marital conflict findings. I was surprised to see that, um, that child behavior didn't affect marital conflict because there's sufficient research to suggest that, there's, um, that there is an effect. So I'm curious as to why in this context, in this pandemic, the results seems to be slightly different. Um, and Dr. Portnoy clarified that the marital conflict findings were introduced at wave two, not at wave one, and that what was actually measured wasn't change, but just presence of uh, marital conflict at wave two based on measures, um, child conduct at wave one. So I'm just curious to see change in conflict, um, whether it be by wave three data or based on wave four data. And so one of the things that I wanna ask, another question I want to sort of put forward, if there is such a thing as a wave four um, or even in the context of wave three, I noticed that there was a significant reduction, a nutrition rate, significant reduction in the overall study, the sample size where it was uh, started out with, I think 2,200 and about half the participants. Attrition is something that, you know, that we have to deal with. 
but I'm just curious as to whether or not there are plans for looking at the different characteristics of the people who are sort of lost um, from wave one to wave two. And if there is a way for data collection effort, will you go back to trying to get everyone at wave one? Because it's possible that people at wave one have sort of um, overcome the barriers or the things that would prevent them, like the bandwidth, that they lost all the bandwidth to participate in the research study as they're just trying to survive day to day. And if they sort of overcome those things and now at wave three or four uh, are more likely to participate. So I'm more looking uh, ahead than I am, um, than I'm looking at. at the end. And um, in terms of the potential explanation for um, the unexpected finding of the lack of prediction of marital conflict, I want to sort of introduce Bowen's family systems theory, which basically talks about how um, the family system is complex, which sort of goes with that transactional model. But it's not just, um, a lot of research has focused on parent to child or child to parent. It's usually focuses on a dyad. So like one parent, like the parent who's reporting um, and the child who they're reporting on. The family system is a little bit more complex where it talks about how um, the family unit can obtain a certain level of um, stability if they're able to, to identify within the family the one person who is supposedly the source of all the family conflicts. So in the terminology that's used is the scapegoat. So if in a family, there is um, a child who has been, a child who has conduct problems, hyperactivity conduct problems, whether internalizing or externalizing, that the rest of the family unit sort of unites against this common foe, um, in this case, the, the scapegoat child, and the family unit outside of that child actually becomes more unified. So it's possible that if the parents can, um, can come together in thinking that, their, that the child's behavior is the source of their stress, that there is sort of an unexpected um, direction in the parents being more united and against the child. And this happens um, in all sorts of families, regardless of the size. So that is, um, but I just wanted to pose that as a potential theoretical explanation for um, how this is um, this finding is unexpected to me. So the um, the study Dr. Porter talks about transactional model and talks about how the um, the research question that is being tested here is the one where the child's behavior is predicting the um, the parent's behavior the parents depression, stress, and relationship conflict. And uh, Dr. Porno already sort of pointed this out, but in terms of future directions and analyses, uh, it sounds like she's already looking at uh, testing the other, um, the other relationships in that more complex transaction model that she just presented. So the answer has already been presented in the context of the, of the presentation. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that, um, if I read this correctly, that the, the parent study controlled for the gender of the parent. Um, and I find that to be, and I guess I have a series of questions or interests more, I think is more accurate word, where there were things that were controlled for, uh, introduced in the, in the regression model as things that were accounted for, in, control for and not sort of allowed to vary. And I'm just curious as to whether or not some more, what are considered simplistic, like simpler statistics. So basically univariate by variant statistics that look at, by variant statistics that look at differences in, um, in the different outcome measures by categories of the sample. So there are a significant amount of studies in the child maltreatment area um, that, have found some really in interesting interaction effects based on the gender of the parent and the gender of the child. Now, I understand the sample size is small, um, 
but I, you know, I'm hoping that there will be more more data collections or future studies who would um, who will sort of be able to address these questions. But I'm just wondering if looking at differences by gender of parent um, might bring about different patterns that can then be sort of looked at later. Um, so that's sort of a questions, interest slash recommendation for future for future um, further analysis for this particular data. Another one is that I, from what I understand, the marital conflict score was ran as an interracial variable. And in that same sort of line of thinking, is it possible that um, when we combine um, a particular variable overall, that we are losing sort of nuances if we were to sort of um, dumb down the data where instead of using the interracial error, we're looking at it by categories. It's possible that um, there is a differential effect of child behavior on medical conflict if we were to sort of separate out those, um, those families that report minimal, moderate, or high level of marital conflicts. It may be that um, minimal and moderate is sort of expected in a stressful, uh, under stressful situations like a global pandemic, but it may be that certain subsets of the sample um, would show significant influence of child behavior or marital conflict after they sort of reached um, a certain level. Now that sort of negates, um, that there, there is research to suggest that there comes like a tipping point where the effect is no longer um, influential, but prior to that tipping point, is there is there something that we're missing because we're not looking at the nuances by different categories. The other, um, the other thing is in the same sort of line of thinking is the child's age. Um, it's possible that uh, the difficult child behavior at any age is significant, um, important, stressful, has an effect, uh, but it's also possible that different levels of development lead to differential levels of, of effects on, um, on the parent's stress, depression, scores, and marital conflicts. So is there something about very, very young children? I mean, the sample started at age four. Um, so it's like kids who were, who needed some sort of child care, right? Is, is that family context, those who a child can't stay home um, when they are, particularly when they are parents who don't have the luxury of working from home, who, are first responders, who are nurses, who are uh, police officers and have no child care plan to sort of back that up. Is that context different than a parent who has a 16, 17 year old at home, which has its own sets of stressors, right? But at least the child care component isn't uh, a reality, like the legitimate safety and care of a child um, while they're at work outside of home in, in a pandemic um, may be different than just looking at things overall. In that same um, line, I apologize, I misspelled that, the, the parent I, the parent study has some component of occupation measured. Um, and I'm just curious as to what the different occupations were. Um, there's, there's, um, there was no indication in the study of that data. Uh, I believe a lot of you are involved in this study, and so you might you might have a better perspective on what occupations the people who participated, what occupations they were a part of, and then of course in particular those high level response um, categories, how how their experience was different from those who could stay at home, who could teach from home, who didn't have I have a nine year old, who didn't have to worry about his child care plan because I was home um, to be able to attend to his needs. Of course, that brings, you know, other work-related issues, but not child care-related issues. And are those things different? I believe I already spoke about, um, you know, the losing um, about half the participants and whether or not there's any analyses. Um, if there's any indication at, at this point of um, how the people who were lost were different from the people who were retained. Um, and if there's any effort, what's there any effort made in wave three to ensure that those wave one people 
were available in wave two, even if wave, um, wave three, even if wave two was sort of skipped. Um, I'd like to um, applaud your efforts for doing a self-report study uh, because in this area, now this is based on Massachusetts data. So it's US, and not only US is based on a state, but based on the official statistics that have been reported, um, 51As, which is the, the way in which we report um, suspected child abuse or child neglect, went significantly down um, as compared to you know, pre post pandemic, substantially lower. Um, home removals were also substantially lower. Um, and those might seem like really great indicators under normal circumstances, right? So less people are reporting um, and less children are being removed from their homes. But the, the, I guess the backstory or the reason why these data appear as such is because now you have children at home who are away from school teachers and after school programs and other mandate professional mandate reporters who are the main source of, um, of people of children coming to the attention of child protective services here in the United States. Um, so I, I think your 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 study, your self-report study is is extremely important in the context of we really can't trust right now the official statistics because they're actually representing um, different social dynamics, not necessarily a true um, research relationship, an empirical relationship that's just based on pure data. There's background information, social conditions that shape the reason why things might appear to look better in the same way that when we change the definition of a crime, when we went from forcible rape to, um, to basically any sort of persuasion, not by force and sort of sexual persuasion, you can see that the numbers went skyrocketing and that looks like it's negative. But actually, it just means that our definition has broadened to a point where now we can include more cases and it looks bad in the data. But those contextual factors are extremely important. And I think that this study does a really great job of filling in that gap. Um, so once again, thank you very much um, for your efforts. Um, one of the things that um, in reading Dr. Portnoy's um, uh, presentation, uh, the last line in the, um, in the study was basically that providing support for parents during this particular period, period of disaster, could help, could help improve mental health outcomes for parents and reduce levels of stress. And to that point, I want to introduce you to another study. It's a 2020 study um, that's titled Child Maltreatment During COVID-19 Pandemic, consequences of parental job loss on psychological and physical abuse towards children. So this is a little bit, this is different, right? It's not stress, it's not depression. This is um, how, can, how the current conditions have impacted the parent's likelihood of engaging in not so great parenting, right? To the point where we've classified them as abuse. And um, Dr. Portnoy showed that between 20 to 30% of um, people who responded said that work-related um, and finance-related stressors seem to be uh, a significant stressor during this time. So this sort of gets at one form of stressor, which is parental job loss, and its effect on psychological abuse and um, physical abuse. So this is a US-based sample only. Um, and some of the important findings were that um, parents who used reframing coping strategies was less likely to abuse. Actually, let me start with this one. So younger, the findings basically were that parents who lost their job were significantly more likely to engage in psychological and physical abuse at, at both ends. Uh, this is a sample of children between the ages of four and 10. So there's some overlap with your study sample. And basically found job loss during a pandemic significantly um, contributed to the increased risk of child maltreatment in both forms. Um, the younger the child, the more likely they were to engage in both psychological and physical abuse. Also, having a previous history of child maltreatment perpetration, so parents who physically and psychologically abuse their children were more likely to do it during the pandemic. Um, and so I bring these points to sort of add to Dr. Portnoy's recommendation where we can't just focus on the child, but focus on the entire family unit 
um, and focus on reducing parent stressors and depression in order to you know, ensure that the children are okay. But also, I just want to bring to the attention that those child behaviors, um, those hyperactivity, the conduct problem, um, those things could potentially be measuring something bigger. So like this umbrella term could really be um, basically the child's inability to cope with the stressors that that child is experiencing, right? Because it's not just the parent who's stressed or depressed during a global pandemic. Like children experience things and respond to them and they may be less, um, less able to deal with those things. So those child behaviors could really be reflecting the child's um, inability to cope. And those stressors and that depression could really be uh, related to that parent's inability to cope. So you have a parent who can't cope and a child who can't cope and you have that combination and we have a family who really needs uh, a lot of resources in order to be able to sort of move forward with this. And um, whether you're on the social learning theory side that you know, children learn by observing the behaviors of the parents, or whether you're on the side of a biological, predisposition, biological predisposition or in the interaction of those two, you have uh, a dynamic where Parents need help and resources, and so do the children, so that that family dynamic can improve, right? And we can sort of get back to living life into whatever our new is going to be. So if we're going to focus on reducing levels of stress for parents, something we need to be looking at beyond just the data in this study, but future data is, um, other data is to be able to, A, focus on younger parents, parents who have, reported higher levels of stress and uh, depression and you know, children with conduct disorders and um, to focus specifically as a, as a strategy is to focus on this reframing coping strategies because it seems that parents who can interpret the conditions that they're in a global pandemic are um, better able to mitigate the negative effects of their behavior on their children and therefore the children's behavior on them. Um, so all of these things sort of together lead us to conclude that um, no single social agency can address these issues, but rather that we need to look at the family unit and look at it in collaboration. Not just researchers, not just uh, child protective services, not just the criminal, criminal justice system, but all different sorts of social agency who are now sort of getting back on track. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you so much, Shahira. Fantastic uh, discussant. And um, I'm so glad we invited you to be our, you know, uh, discussant for this paper, but also for um, in terms of providing such a comprehensive overview of our study um, and the study advantages as well as limitations. Um, your critique is, we've definitely got lots of things to, to think about now, as I'm sure uh, you definitely stimulated a lot of questions as well that have come in in the chat, which I hope we'll have the remaining time to um, you know, address. Um, but just before I transition into the Q&A session, um, I wanted to highlight just as part of this webinar and this theme, uh, looking at uh, the impacts of COVID and stress, um, we actually invited our public and participants to join us on a social media challenge. Um, and for our social media challenge, uh, we asked for submissions of things that helped people de-stress as part of this theme. And here is our winning submission. Uh, by Emma Short, who uh, submitted through, I believe it was Twitter. Um, and this is her photo of Queen Mary's Rose Garden in Regent's Park, London. For those of you in the UK, you'll probably recognize it. Uh, for Emma, she's been going there for a lot to de-stress and the vibrant colors and scents of roses have been giving her great escapism every single time. Um, and with that, uh, on a high note, I think we are now ready to take the questions that Shahara, Shahira had posed to us, right, Jill? <laughs> um, many to me as well. So I'll try to just, you know, kick off with the ones that I know how to answer and then leave the rest uh, for, for Jill. Um, but essentially, you know, as researchers, I think all of us do want to just keep collecting data and collecting data. I think the limitation there is really in terms of resources, funding, 
Um, we are applying for funding as well to continue the study. And without, I would say, many of the people on the call today uh, supporting us and continuing to support us, uh, we probably won't have a study at all. So um, I thank you, you know, all of those who are supporting us here today, even in finding out what these findings really mean. Um, so that's your to, your to your question about whether there might be further uh, future co uh, data collection and follow up. Um, in terms of following up people in wave one, uh, we, I, I actually do that every single time. So in the three waves that we have been uh, launching our survey, we've continued to follow people up um, from previous uh, waves. Um, the only limitation there is, as with most online survey studies, uh, is that we only have their emails. So people's emails also change, and I've you know, attempted to collect their updated emails as well and to follow them up then. Um, I, and I think over time, I think also the fact that there's so many kind of online COVID studies happening at the moment as well. I think people are quite, um, there is kind of COVID study fatigue as well in completing surveys. Um, our survey definitely is not one of the shorter ones, um, but we do yield um, more information, I, I'd like to believe. Um, and in our process of disseminating our findings as well, we are really trying to reach a larger audience in terms of what we're finding um, to help inform both policies and everyone's day-to-day -day, you know, coping of the whole situation as well. Um, I think those two are the ones that I can answer, but um, uh, over to Jill, I think, for some of the other questions related to um, the study uh, and your study itself. Um, we have one here, let me just go down the list, um, from, uh, let's see, Anna Christina, um, she asked whether future research could use SES as a protective factor. Um, it could be that families with better financial standing could be buffering from the stress of the pandemic as they wouldn't worry as much um, because about accessing technology, food, et cetera. And I think Shahira also kind of highlighted this as well in, in her discussion. What do you think, Jill? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think this relates also um, to um, several of Jahira's points, um, which I think are all really important, which is, you know, what I presented today was these main relationships. So what's the relationship between child behavior and parental outcomes? What I didn't dive into is moderators of that relationship. So how might those relationships vary for certain people? So is it different depending on SES? Is it different depending on the sex of the child? Um, the sex of the parent, I'm trying to think if there are any others, um, the age of the parent as well, or the child's age. And I think these are all really important questions because I think we will expect some of these relationships to vary based on some of those moderators. Um, so SES is a great example. You know, people who are higher SES, who have more resources, who can maybe even have um, you know, managed to figure out childcare, or they were able to work from home in a way where they didn't have to worry about childcare, we might not expect to see those same relationships between child behavior and say relationship conflict or parental depression. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all really important points. And I think will be an important next step for this research as well is starting to dive into those moderators. Um, I will also say the sample that we have here is relatively older parents. Um, so going to Jahira's point where maybe younger parents have a harder time. Um, so maybe that's why we didn't see some of the relationships we might expect. Um, and a relatively privileged sample as well. Um, so that might explain some of the lack of findings relationship conflict as well. Um, but definitely, um, I think those are important issues that we'll try to address as we move forward. And uh, Anna Christine and uh, Sabrina, who actually left the chat, but she's also thrown in the chat uh, some other factors we should control for. For example, time parents spend with the child per day that might have an impact. Um, whether or not parents are transitioning, working from part time to working kind of uh, midway through the pandemic, um, and that I think is related to J Jahara's point about occupation, perhaps of of our participants, um, and so forth. Um, there's another question in, in the chat about. Um, uh, whether families who have had special needs are included in the study. Is there any study plan for such population? Um, perhaps I could answer that really quickly. Um, yes, so we do ask uh, parents to indicate whether or not um, their child has any special, uh, special needs. Um, we can also delve into that and look at that further. However, from what, from memory, from what I've uh, looked at and, and 
in the data is that uh, that that sample is very very small. So if anything, um, there I do know of other studies out there who are now planning future waves and data collection for um, children with special education uh, needs and their parents as well to look at that dynamic. Um, so I, yeah, I do know there are a few uh, researchers in the field looking and, and doing that research. Um, and then Kemi asks, are there any plans to come up with interventions for parents, children, family units? If so, do you have any prelim preliminary ideas about what those potential interventions could be? Uh, I think this is for, for both Jill and Jahara, and I think Jahara kind of mentioned, preempted this question as well. So yeah, over to you guys. I'm working on a, on a project with, with a student where I'm sort of consistently making the argument that I sort of very briefly made at the end where um, if we want to have a really positive effect on something as complex as the family and childhood victimization and juvenile delinquency that we can't just leave it in the child protective system and it can't just be limited to um, the criminal justice system but that there's other social institutions that need to get involved, that need to be a part of the conversation. Um, I don't have a program in mind, um, just more like the, the idea that um, the education system needs to sort of be involved in a more systematic way than just as mandated reporters. Um, that the church needs to get involved as a social institution that has a lot of influence as to how people interpret the situations that they're in, and what kinds of parenting practices were, so are acceptable or not acceptable, and how people in all sorts of different leadership positions need to sort of um, work together, share information and speak out um, or promote, right? Sort of like primary prevention, not just responding to something after it's happened, but uh, prevention efforts. That's what I want to sort of see. And, and the one social institution that I, I want to focus on right now is the church. I have, uh, I, I have a, a master's degree too, actually, in, in theology. So I'm a person of faith. So I'm always going to resort to that as a thing that needs to be involved in positive social action. So teachers say education. Researchers say research. Government officials say policies. Uh, but if really everybody working together in all these different areas and communicating with each other is a necessity because each and every one of the different social issues that we're dealing with are extremely complex. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I don't know if that answers the question posed. Um, it's more of an argument for collaboration across agencies and not working in silos as opposed to one particular program. I like that. I like that <laughs> to end on that. Um, I think Anna Christina also asked another question, which I had missed earlier, but depending on when the data was collected, could it be that marital conflict was measured after parents became adjusted to co-parenting during the pandemic, given that we measured parental uh, marital conflict uh, in wave two and not in wave one? Um, are we just not seeing a complete picture of marital conflict? What do you think, Jill? Yeah, I think that's um, certainly possible that parents had kind of just maybe learned to resolve their issues. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the whole story because I think, um, you know, relationship conflict usually isn't so, isn't always so easily resolved. Um, but I think it's an important question that maybe we can try to start disentangling in wave three as well. So we might be able to see how relationship conflict changes over time. Um, maybe it will can, you know, decrease from wave two to wave three, which um, maybe supports that possibility that parents already had started to figure out how to manage their conflict. Um, yeah. If that's the case, then that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's exciting, right. Well, it's great that that's great news. Um, and just tacking on to this to the same question from Presley, um, uh, if relationship conflict was a measure taken from both married and non-married individuals, could being married and or increased co-parenting due to more parents working from home act as a protective factor and protect against increases in relationship conflict. Um, and also, as you mentioned, that providing resources to parents could help mitigate stress that is contributed to uh, by, by their children. Would providing children with more access to mental health and other resources be another possible mechanism for helping reduce parent uh, parental stress as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think absolutely supporting children will be an important way to help parents during the pandemic. 
So to the extent that we can reduce child behavior problems, reduce, um, you know, child emotional issues, I think that will be really important in helping parents. And as Johaira mentioned, you know, a lot of these conduct problems you might have seen might have been kids who just don't know how to handle the stress of the situation and don't know how to express it in a different way. Um, so helping, like Johaira mentioned, children and parents reframe their coping strategies. Um, so understand how the stress they're dealing with and how they're expressing that stress, I think absolutely would be important, um, focusing on doing that in both kids and also the parents as well. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, we didn't see differences in relationship conflict between people who were married versus those who weren't married. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know to what extent marriage is playing a role, though I, sh I will say most of our sample was married. So um, in this subsample, sorry, most of this subsample was married. So um, a little bit difficult to look at the effect of marriage in relation to um, relationship conflict in this particular sample. Yeah. And I think that brings into question also how long you've been married for and, you know, all of these things and maybe people's uh, conflict resolution strategies and, and so forth. Um, one question also, one, one more for Jill, um, as I'm going to launch the feedback poll in a second too, but is there any changes in child emotion and behavior from wave one to wave two? Good question. So in this particular study, we're only looking at child behavior in wave one. Um, so we're not looking at those changes from wave one to wave two. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the answer to that particular question. Yes. And, but we will have um, the data from wave three, which we can look at uh, later on uh, in the year as well. Um, in the meantime, as people are pop, you know, throwing more questions in the chat, I'd like to just launch a quick um, feedback poll on this uh, webinar for those of you who are still um, around. It'll be fantastic uh, for you to complete that as we're still um, you know, in the process of this webinar series and we're always looking to improve our sessions as well. Whilst that's going on, we did get one more uh, question from um, Chi Min, who's always attending our session. So I'm grateful for her participation. Uh, she says, thank you very much for, for the presentations. I understand that this may be constrained by the limits of the sample, but do you think we might expect differences when looking at family units across different countries and cultures? For example, due to different family dynamics or members considered central to the unit, such as grandparents and other caregivers. Great question. Over to you guys. Yeah, great question. I think that's another example of uh, an important uh, future direction for this research, especially because we do have a global sample, is to look at these differences and these relationships across countries, um, as well as across family structures as well. So absolutely. Thank you for the question. Sounds like a stay tuned uh, <laughs> response. And uh, for anyone who's on the call too, I know that you know many of the questions and comments you guys uh, suggest are really fantastic. If any of you are researchers as well in your own right, do get in touch with us because we do have this data available and we'd happy, you know, we'll be happy to uh, work with you on anything, any kind of questions that you might have as well. Um, follow up question from Kylie, uh, somewhat related to Chiman's uh, question, what about biracial households? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't, Carrie, do we have um, data on that? I'm not sure. Um, we have data on participants' ethnicity. Yes, we do. So we could, you know, perhaps use that to answer this question further, I guess, to further the, yeah. Yeah, we have, so for the participant themselves, we would know if they're biracial. I don't know if you mean like whether the, the different child, household yeah. members are different races. I don't know um, if we yeah. could look at that. Don't but we do have, have race. Yeah, we only have data on the participants themselves. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, again, I think is another important question that we certainly will um, look at in, in the future. Cool. Uh, are, are there any further questions? Um, we do have actually one more that has been sent to us. Um, if child behavior is not a significant predictor of relationship conflict in wave two, how might these results differ for families with access wider, with access to wider support systems or greater academic resources? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's possible that when we look at families who don't have that kind of access, 
maybe we will see those relationships between child behavior and relationship conflict. Um, so it could be, um, you know, going back that we just, we're treating everybody in the sample sort of as a homogenous group right now, but we sort of need to break people down into different groups based on maybe SES or access to resources um, to really try to understand how family dynamics differ um, for different groups of people. Yes. All righty. I think we've come to the, the end of our questions, or we've definitely answered all of the ones that uh, we've been posed in the chat. Um, perhaps maybe I can ask one to the panelists, given we have a couple more minutes, and maybe we might have some last minute uh, people who might want to want to ask a question. Uh, my question um, to you is, what are, I guess, the short term, you know, immediate things that people can be doing now? Um, if, for example, you know, they are in complicated relationships, or they're feeling, you know, that they're a bit trapped in, in families where, you know, there's always conflict. Are there any you know, tips in terms of how they can uh, resolve some of that anxiety or, or de-stress in, in a way? What are your I would say, um, and I'll just speak briefly, um, you know, for parents, especially, you know, reaching out and getting help. Um, so trying to act, accessing mental health care services, reaching out to, um, to therapists, um, whether you're doing that, you know, virtually, like in the, um, you know, the telehealth type situation or in person. So reaching out for help if you need it, I think is the first step. Um, and then also just, you know, for parents, especially thinking about your self care during this time. So, um, you know, a lot of parents, I think, are focusing on their child. What can I do for my child? Um, but if you don't take care of yourself, it's going to be difficult um, to help your child. So, thinking about ways that you personally can take care of yourself, whether that's thinking about your diet, um, you know, getting exercise. Um, for those of you who are in the U.S., it's a bit of a heat wave. You might not be wanting to walk around outside, <laughs> but once this heat passes, um, you know, taking a walk, getting outside and doing what you can to take care of yourself as well during this time. Great advice. Jahara? Adding on to uh, Dr. Courtney's um, self-care comment, um, we have a tendency not to do that. Um, and it's extremely important. It's sort of like, um, like thinking about that positive, um, like restructuring your mind, sort of thinking about things differently um, and sort of learning to like, look at this silver lining um, and how your self-care can affect your children's ability to play, right? If you, won't, if you won't do self-care for yourself, do it to be a good role model for your children, right? Like some, we might not be predisposed to do things for ourselves, but we will be, we will do it for our children and our loved ones. Um, but now that, you know, things are opening back up and, and, and um, offices are sort of functioning uh, at the capacity that they can right now with like things aren't um, sort of shut down and locked down and um, looking for um, not just individual therapy, but family therapy. So therapy for yourself, therapy for just a child and the combination of the two where the parent can um, deal with their, their issues, their mental health um, difficulties. The child can learn different coping skills and then sort of together you can resolve those things that have been said and done um, during a time where people were sort of constrained and limited um, um, spatially. And in that same vein, it's, you know, it's finding time to sort of be away from each other. Uh, it, and and it's, it's sort of like understanding that that's okay. Um, I've had, um, and a lot of my friends have we've sort of like interchanged children <laughs> so that they can sort of have time away from like the parent, but you know, we sort of come in as friendship co-parents and just using your resources as a way to be able to like de-stress, to go down uh, to the garden and just smell the roses, right? To be able to uh, engage in some self-care and model to our children that we love them uh, but that some safe space is, is also a good thing. Lovely. I think that that's a almost together. You guys have covered the grounds of 
self-care, making sure you're okay in order to take care of others, to nutrition, to, you know, having a, a routine of going outdoors or ending work early even. Um, and then also thinking about how we can all help others too in the community, if that is at all possible. Um, there's one more question that came in uh, by Chi Min um, regarding uh, Dr. Michael's suggestion of the family systems theory as an explanation for child behavior, not being associated with relationship conflict. Not entirely sure I've understood it accurately, but I wanted to ask if this idea of having a scapegoat is in any way sustainable. So while it potentially addresses relationship conflict in wave two, might it still lead to negative outcomes? I'm thinking about this in relation to the finding of the effect of reframing. Yes, it could lead to negative outcomes, particularly for the scapegoated child, right? Because this child is sort of getting the brunt of the stressors while I may be released of my stress because now I am united to my partner. But then of course, um, the, the negative attributions that I, I make for my child's behavior is going to affect the way that I parent that child. So yes, the family system theory framework was introduced as a possible explanation for an unexpected finding, but it's like no way uh, presented as, um, as a resolution, just sort of an explanation mm -hmm. about you know, what some theorists might say and how that sort of, um, um, it's it's not a new theory, but it's it's not um, it's sort of not the expected outcome. So um, so it was just a potential explanation. There are definitely negative consequences for the one person who becomes the scapegoat. That person is going to need additional help. The entire family, right, is going to need to be able to resolve those issues um, and sort of take responsibility for everyone's role because it is you know complex and transactional. Mm -hmm. Great. And with that, I think it's time for us to close the session. Just wanted to remind everyone else on the call still that we do have two more uh, webinars uh, in this series. Uh, happy, uh, you know, it'll be great if you guys can also tune in and share your ideas and thoughts. Hope you enjoyed this session with uh, Dr. Jill Portnoy and Dr. Chahira Michael. Um, and yeah, hope to see you at a future webinar as well. Thank you, everyone.